Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we are talking systemic risk in the commodities sector. What are the sources of systemic risk? What would it mean if such an event happened for not only the commodities sector, but the general public and the broader financial system around the world? And what are some of the solutions, if there are any, to mitigating such a disaster? Our guest is Craig Perong professor at the University of Houston, an adjunct professor at the University of Geneva. As always, if you enjoy the show, please do leave us a positive review on the platform you're listening on, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Craig, welcome back to the show. Oh, it's good to be back. This is a timely discussion, and I'm looking forward to it. We're talking about systemic risk and systemic risk in the commodity sector itself, and then also what it means for the globe and global industry. Can you, before we sort of start kick into whether the commodity sector does present systemic risk. Can you just give us a definition of what we mean by systemic risk? It's it's thrown around, but what does that actually mean? What would you define as a a systemic event? Well, so I I would define a systemic risk or a systemic event as a shock that has uh, impacts uh, and adverse impacts and large adverse impacts on the broader financial system. So usually it is, you know, there's a shock that occurs at one financial institution or one sector of the financial market, and then that uh, has uh, spillover effects, knockout effects, cascading effects into the broader financial system uh, in ways that can bring you know, a lot of other uh, you know, firms and institutions uh, to, to risk of failure. Okay, so we, in discussions prior to this, we've highlighted three big areas or potential sources of systemic risk, or at least major disruption, namely exchange risk, concentration risk, and then obviously exogenous fact shocks, government intervention, etc., that could play into this. Let's start with exchange risk. We obviously had the events of the LME earlier in the year, and this is essentially where an exchange ceases to function in its primary goal of providing prices to the market. Can you, I guess, A, is that a correct definition of exchange risk? And then can you start working us through the how, what you mean by that and how that could occur? Sure. And I, I, I think that's a good definition of exchange risk, but I would also sort of you know, broaden that a little bit to you know, encompass uh, you know, clearing as a, you know, one of the you know, functions of exchanges. Most exchanges do their own clearing now. And so, uh, you know, so interpreted broadly, I would, uh, you know, that would be a, a good definition. Now, the LME situation is uh, you know, somewhat unique. It's, it's uh, hard to come up with a historic uh, parallel. Uh, but basically, the idea behind exchange risk is, and this is where the clearing system uh, plays a very important role in that, is that when there's a big price movement, these are zero-sum games. If you're talking about the derivatives markets, uh, for every dollar gained, uh, somebody else loses a dollar. And also the way that the exchanges and clearing systems work is on a mark-to-market system where gains and losses are crystallized immediately through the mark-to-market process. So what happened at the LME is you had a big shock in the nickel market. Somebody lost a lot of money. They immediately had to stump up the cash to cover those losses. They were apparently unable or unwilling to do so. And their uh, failure to pay or risk of failure to pay meant that the exchange could no longer continue to operate. It it basically had to pull the plug in order to prevent a collapse of several other brokerage firms uh, that were members of the LME and arguably the LME clearinghouse itself. So, okay, thanks. So there's kind of two angles to this, isn't there? Or there's two, two factors at play. One is the exchange itself fails and what that means, and then were the exchange to fail and prices no longer to be discoverable, what would that mean for all participants, irrespective of whether they have open positions on that exchange? So let's let's start with what happens if an exchange fails? And can you just, for my benefit, help me understand why those exchanges that do their own clearing, this is a factor? 
Yes. Well, so essentially, yeah, so you, you, you fail when you can't pay what you're owed. And so essentially the clearing houses at an exchange like the LME or the CME or Urex, uh, whichever, uh, yeah, ICE, whatever exchange you want to uh, talk about that does its own clearing, they stand between the buyers and the sellers. And so through the mark to mark to process, uh, when somebody loses money, they owe the exchange, uh, the clearinghouse, uh, that money. But there's also an obligation for the exchange clearinghouse to pay those that are on the winning side of the market. And if uh, there's not enough cash coming in from the losers to pay the winners, that means that the uh, clearinghouse fails. Now, there are also other sorts of complications because you know, brokerage firms, uh, intermediaries, they, you know, their, their capital is at risk to cover the losses of the losers. And so usually a clearinghouse failure is going to be associated with the failure of a lot of other entities, particularly the members of the clearinghouse. And, and you know, then basically the, the clearinghouse can no longer continue to operate. If the clearinghouse can't operate, then the exchange can't operate. And, and that would have, we haven't seen it yet. We haven't seen it. I shouldn't say yet. <laughs> but can you just give us some sense of the catastrophic impact? I mean, would that present systemic risk? It de- really depends on the clearinghouse. So it, it has happened before. So uh, when I was a small child during the crash of 1987, I witnessed this uh, up close. Uh, In the crash of 1987, the Hong Kong Futures Exchange Clearinghouse failed. uh, And basically that shut down the Hong Kong financial markets for the better part of a month. The market in uh, the the two biggest derivative exchanges at the time, Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the Chicago Board of Trade, came within an ace of that happening on uh, October 20th, 1987. And you know, that would have been utterly catastrophic. You know, so essentially, that would have uh, have led to the uh, the shutdown of financial markets, not just the ones directly impacted, but others like the New York Stock Exchange, because they share member firms and so on. Uh, so, if the clearinghouse that's impacted is big enough. Yeah, that can have really broad impacts on the financial system. And that's why in one of his first uh, sort of important acts as head of the Fed, Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan essentially effectively bailed out the, the Chicago clearinghouses uh, because he realized the, uh, the systemic consequences of, uh, of their failure. Let's, we don't need to use names, but let's say one of the big ones, this happened, right? So we see a, whatever the trigger is, an, ex, you know, an escalation in the Russia's invasion of Ukraine or some big event that essentially you see what happened in nickel on the LME, you get this thousand percent price rises or, you know, there's an intervention in Europe over gas and so forth. And that clearinghouse fails. What then starts to happen that really cascades into a systemic risk? Well, so so again, I mean, a couple parts of it. One is is that the clearinghouse failure is going to be highly correlated with the failure uh, of a lot of other financial institutions that are that are members of the clearinghouse. So that's one direct effect. But also, they, I mean, here's what we saw with the LME: is that effectively, you know, they they did shut down. And so basically then if a a large clearinghouse slash exchange ceased operating, then essentially uh, hedging and trading and price discovery on that exchange would essentially shut down. And it's uh, hard to imagine that those sort of circumstances would not lead to cascading effects onto other exchanges, other clearinghouses. I mean, frequently we see during systemic events is just sort of a contagion effect. Is it, oh boy, that clearinghouse is in trouble. Oh boy, well, maybe these other clearinghouses are in trouble too. And that can become a a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it's it's basically the potential risk for uh, financial gridlock uh, that would impact not just the impact of exchanges, but essentially the, the financial markets broadly. Yeah. And we're going to come on to some of these sort of doomsday scenarios. Okay, so you've got this, you've got an exchange, you've got the exchange risk. Obviously, at the moment, they tackle this by initial margin requirements and then margining throughout the, or, or changing the margining mechanisms throughout the, the trade, right? That's, the, that's their current defense. Right. And, and it's worth pointing out, though, that, you know, that, that that's sort of the 
the margining mechanism is a double-edged sword because it's really the margining mechanism, in particular, the you know, sort of the real-time or close to real-time daily mark-to-market, which uh, can be the precipitating factor. So it's it's really the 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 margin mechanism makes the financial system tightly coupled, and it's tightly coupled systems that are vulnerable to collapse. Yeah, and this will be important later on. Are those margining mechanisms posted, explained, or are they can they change on an ad hoc basis? Well, so a couple answers to that. So if you're talking about the variation margin mechanism, yes, people know that that, that, yeah, that that's, they know how that works, marking to market. There are possibilities, though, uh, for exchanges to call for extraordinary uh, margin calls. So essentially, there's some optionality that allows exchanges and clearing houses to essentially speed up the margining process. The day of, of the Brexit vote uh, uh, in you know, several years ago, uh, crash of 1987, big market moves intraday, and what the uh, clearinghouses did under those circumstances it either called for exceptional margin or acceleration of margin payments. Uh, so in the in the Brexit example, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, the London clearinghouse LCH did was they had a uh, extraordinary margin call. But then they were just holding the cash and they weren't paying it out to the other side. And that sort of exacerbated the, the liquidity crunch uh, that that event created. In terms of the initial margining mechanism, you know, generally, you know, it's known, but uh, a lot of market participants have been critical about the opacity of the margining methodologies that clearing has as an employee. Yeah. Okay. So that's... These all interweave ultimately, because then we move on to concentration risk. The, you, the, over the last 10 years, the number of participants in the commodity sector has shrunk and has been concentrated in fewer and fewer hands predominantly. And for the most part, you know, a number of these independent oil traders or commodity traders, and then some producers that still participate. And then obviously some hedge funds and other financial institutions. What was obviously notable was that in March this year, in the wake of Ukraine's invasion by Russia, you had a number of trading houses in Europe write to the ECB, the European Central Bank, looking for support, a move that took many by surprise and will no doubt have its own ramifications in terms of regulation. And you yourself have spent significant time and ink on talking about concentration risk in the commodities sector. Where are we at in that right now and you know are we more at risk than we were 10 years ago and it, it ties into these you know the, the the cash required the capital required the equity these organizations need to be able to participate in a much more volatile and highly priced environment yeah i, I think it's an important issue and there's sort of two aspects of, of concentration that i would like to focus on uh, concentration risk the first is of the position holders which is what you're referring to but there's also a concentration risk in terms of uh the intermediaries, the uh, clearing brokers or futures commission merchants, as they're called in the uh, United States. So, and I think the LME situation is a good example of that, is that that was sort of a classic situation of concentration risk. Uh, Shang, uh, the big nickel, Chinese nickel company that was short massive quantities in what it alleges was a hedge, probably wasn't a hedge. Even if it was a hedge, it was a really dirty hedge because they weren't hedging uh, something that was deliverable on the exchange in terms of quality and location. That basically means that if you have one big guy fail, that means that there's a big hole in the system, uh, you know, sort of a, in the clearinghouse. And that's the kind of thing that can precipitate this. So that's the, the main reason to be concerned about the concentration of positions. And that's one of the reasons why, for example, clearinghouses and exchanges uh, charge uh, frequently have, char have a surcharge in terms of margin for concentrated positions because they realize this. So that's an example of concentration risk and how it can play out very badly. But one of the things we've noticed in the commodity markets generally, and in the financial markets generally, as you noted, uh, is that the big players are getting bigger. 
So, for example, if you look at oil or industrial metals trading, it used to be that, you know, so the uh, apocryphal story was, uh, hey, all you need to be to be a trading firm is uh, you have a, a desk and a phone and a Rolodex. Well, now that's not true. And there's been a you know, substantial uh, increase in the uh, concentration of oil trading, metals trading, grain trading, et cetera. And so uh, even to the extent that these firms are participating in the markets primarily as hedgers, hedgers can blow up too. And one of these uh, entities blowing up would have uh, potential for these broader systemic effects. Uh, so the, the other aspect of, of uh, concentration that I think is worth mentioning is a concentration among clearing brokers, futures commission merchants. So you go back in the day, you know, there are a lot of independent FCMs. Now the sector has become incredibly concentrated, and essentially the major banks are also the major clearing members uh, of exchange clearing houses. Yeah, so that means that the intermediary side of the business is also more concentrated and therefore more risk uh, to problems with one of the uh, uh, the intermediaries. And also the, the fact that the intermediaries are now you know, the banks, uh, there's uh, even more intimate connection between the clearing system and the banking system. Yeah, which is going to be important when we talk about contagion. What, what did the, you know that letter to the ECB essentially seeking su- financial support in a time of okay really high volatility and you know access to liquidity? What did that say to you about how close we got to an issue? You know what did that say to you about how risky some of these you know the, the concentration risk is at the moment? I think it was uh, a rather uh telling red flag that it indicated that these are the kinds of companies that are usually not anxious to seek attention or bring attention to themselves. And the fact that they were willing to go public with uh, such an extraordinary request suggested to me that they were clearly worried and you know, they, they would be in a position to know. You've got this concentration risk. And then the final leg to the stool, shall we say, is government intervention or just exogenous shocks. Obviously, we've seen quite a number of those. And as yet, energy for the most part is still flowing, albeit at a reduced rate from Russia to Europe. We're seeing what's going on with a number of you know, German utilities that are, are struggling in that environment. You know, And there's talk of nationalising the TTF, whatever it might be. And, and, and that would trigger impacts on exchanges and con- highlight concentration risk. Frame up for us how what these type of events might be that might trigger a collapse in a, in a, a significant organization or many or an exchange. And it seems like we're, we're really only at the beginning of this story. Yeah, well, so I think there are two aspects of it. One is a sort of a, 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 an economic shock, if we will, that would have a big impact on prices. And so this would be a shock independent of government action and essentially the kinds of things that we saw in the aftermath of the uh, Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine is an example of that. But we saw something even earlier. I mean, there, there were sort of the precursors of this end of the third quarter, uh, fourth quarter last year, particularly with the European gas market, where even before any of the uh, Russia-Ukraine events uh, had occurred, that there was a big disruption in the uh, European gas and electricity markets caused by a a, a conjunction of uh, economic events, including a wind drought in the UK and Europe, et cetera. And so that's one sort of thing where you have uh, big shocks. And I would notice, I would note that right now, the price impact of those kinds of economic shocks is magnified by the tight underlying fundamental supply and demand conditions. So if you look, you know, so if you think about what are the shock absorbers in the system, or well, one shock absorber in a commodity markets is inventory. Well, essentially inventories of uh, you know, virtually every commodity are at rock bottom levels. And so you know, you know, some other big supply shock or big demand shock, yeah, they, yeah, those can't be absorbed out of inventories. If you can't, uh, if inventories can't absorb the shock, then that has to go to prices, and that's the price movements that can cause the kinds of effects that we've talked about before. The other thing, which is also implicit in your questions, is uh, well, 
the sort of a reflexivity in the system. And that is, you know, the government is essentially, uh, governments are the 800 pound gorillas. Uh, they react to these events too, and they react to events in ways that can be potentially disruptive. Yeah, there's you know, serious talk now about imposing price controls or things of that nature. Yeah, at least this is a, a subject that has been uh, yeah, publicly raised. And you know, if you know, sort of a ham-handed intervention in the markets uh, by governments uh, could be extremely disruptive. So I, I guess one example would be you know, go back in history and look when the um, during the Carter administration, when government policy on you know, selling grain to Russia caused a big movement in in prices uh, in the Chicago Board of Trade, and uh, I think that that caused the closure of the exchange for a day or two, and then the administration sort of realized that oh my God, we'd gone too far, and they uh, they backed off. But it is uh, you know, conceivable to manage, uh, imagine governments taking actions which they believe are a response to economic events uh, like war and uh, that they can actually make things worse. So that's also a risk in the system. I mean, if, if, if you want to talk about concentration risk, you know, a government like the United States, the, <laughs> uh, the ECB, I mean, that's the, they're, they're pretty concentrated and uh, you know, they would have, uh, you know, their actions can have major ramifications. Are you seeing, before we kind of get on to the likelihood of this happening and how it could play out more broadly, are you seeing, do you get the sense that, again, that we've been a year into this, right? And more of you include sort of, you know, events during COVID's initial uh, outbreak. Are you seeing organizations sort of preparing defenses for these kind of events? Are they, you know, building cash positions, taking risk off? building equity up to, to manage the, you know, to be able to raise more finance in the future. Are you seeing a recognition or is this still largely, or is it head in the sand moment still? I think that there has been a recognition. And, and so, for example, in parallel with the letter to the ECB, uh, you saw at the time a lot of the major commodity trading firms trying to take measures to shore up their balance sheets, uh, increase their access to liquidity. You know, so definitely they had you know, sort of a come to Jesus moment. and they have taken measures to put themselves in a better situation to survive uh, these sorts of disruptions. On the exchange side, well, what we've seen is an increase in uh, initial margins, a rather substantial increase. Uh, the uh, Federal Reserve's financial stability report uh, that came out a few weeks ago uh, had a nice graph uh, illustrating how, how that has played out. Also, I would note that we've seen you know, substantial evidence that market participants are cutting back positions. So if you look, for example, at open interest in Brent or WTI, seen a rather substantial decline in open interest, uh, which means that market participants are, are reducing positions. So, so basically on every margin where you can, no pun intended, where market participants can adjust, they have been adjusting. Okay, can you give us, I know this is a bit of an unquestioned, but could you, without, again, mentioning names, can you just give us one a scenario which you feel is likely or could happen, or at least in the world of possibility, that would lead to a systemic event, disruption in the commodity sector? The, the one that would immediately come to mind, which would essentially be like Russia, Ukraine on steroids, would be China and Taiwan. I mean, that would have cataclysmic uh, impacts on commodity markets uh, with cataclysmic impacts on prices that would potentially be a catalyst for all of these uh, kinds of changes. I think that would have, a, yeah, we'd be in a whole different uh, world of risk, right. you know. Yeah. Some other examples. So for example, you know, President Biden came out the other day and says, oh, we're going to have another pandemic. Well, sort of the, the previous close run thing that we had in the markets more broadly, not just uh, commodities, but also treasuries and equities, et cetera, was the COVID shock in March of 2020, which caused serious problems uh, in the clearing system. So yeah, that would be another potential scenario. So, so you, you can think of a lot of you know, big potential exogenous shocks that would have big impacts on prices. And again, you know, what I would 
emphasize and which probably hasn't gotten the attention that it should is that there's just not a lot of play in the system right now to absorb these sort of shocks. Yeah. So taking that, you know, let, let's say tomorrow Russia shuts off the gas to Europe. Mm -hmm. Conceivably, that could take down a large utility that then has, you know, significant hedgings on, on exchanges, or it could take down one of these major, major trading houses, all of whom have got significant natural gas businesses now that then spreads through an exchange and clearinghouse fails. I mean, it doesn't have to be sort of um, a global event so much as actually because of very tight supply, it could just be yeah. something like that, that that could conceivably shut down exchanges and take out, I don't want to sound too gloomy, God forbid, but it could take out a number of significant participants. Yes, no, that's, that's a fair scenario as well. So I... You know, I, I frequently call myself the clearing Cassandra, and so it uh, sounds like you're <laughs> potentially uh, joining that course. But yes, yeah, and again, we're already in a very tight situation, and yeah, that's why shocks, which in other circumstances might not be as dire in their impacts, under current circumstances could set off the chain reaction that you described. And and also that that would be likely a scenario where you would see government intervention. So you know, European governments have already talked very seriously about imposing price controls. Well, that would have extremely disruptive effects. It would be kind of hard to, I, I can't immediately play through what the scenario would be, but it certainly would be a big shock that would have impact on prices. And anything that impacts prices is going to have an impact on the exchange and clearing system. Yeah, I mean, essentially, uh, we've said this a few times, we've been on kind of a 40-year a march of economic growth right. that's benefited the world immensely. You know, incomes have gone up five times, but also in a sort of environment, a closed system of open and free trade, liberalizing markets. And some of these scenarios just weren't really contemplated. Absolutely. So, so the, you know, the, the flip side of an interconnected world is that shocks can propagate more easily, more broadly. And you know, again, and that's one of the things I would emphasize that this, this aspect of tight coupling, the world is more tightly coupled. One of the sources of coupling are these financial links through the derivatives markets, through the clearing system, et cetera. And more tightly coupled systems are more vulnerable to chaos. Okay. So how would this go? So I want to sort of just understand a little bit how this goes from being kind of a, a commodity event to a contagion event and how it would impact both the general public and how it would impact the broader financial markets. Yeah, no, that's an issue. And so it's it's basically an issue of a scale is what I would say is that the, you know, the, the commodity markets are you know, in comparison to the fixed income markets and the equity markets they are relatively small, which does reduce the likelihood that a commodity-specific shock could uh, have broader ramifications and these sort of spillover effects. However, you know, again, we're in a situation now where these commodity shocks could have you know, impacts for economic growth. And so one potential reason that the uh, uh, Western economies may be veering into recession is these commodity shocks, particularly the oil shocks and the energy shocks. And a broader economic downturn could be the kind of thing that puts greater stress on the financial system generally. Yeah. I mean, and then from a general public standpoint, I mean, were you to have a collapse of a major commodities exchange, a major participant or a couple of major participants, which again, that concentration risk is real. These trading houses, some of them have 10% of the world's oil market flowing through their books at any given point. Do you see a scenario where the four courts are empty, the whole system breaks down? I wrote a white paper for Trafigura about, you know, going on eight years ago and now where I talked about systemic risk. And and that's again, I mean that that I don't think that the failure even of one of the big commodity trading firms that that per se would have these broader systemic uh, ramifications. You know, so there would be uh, intermediation would become more costly. 
the the capacity to move oil around the world would be reduced to some degree. But we've seen things like that happen in the past. So, for example, when the uh, merchant energy sector collapsed in the United States about 20 years ago, almost exactly, it didn't really have a noticeable impact on the U.S. economy. But I think the, the issue would more be that the failure of one of these firms would be correlated with caused by one of these events that has these broader impact on prices that could set off the, the, the chain reactions that we described earlier. Yeah, it's also, as you kind of alluded to, that we're probably, there's going to be other factors going on where all these, these these events to happen that would, you know, there's probably other geopolitical events as well that would make it quite hard to disentangle what's a, just a, a commodity only event right. compared to a more global event. Right. right. You know, this is where Craig Perron becomes uh, head of the Federal Reserve or, or head of the CFTC or whatever, you know, you, you wish it to be. It would be nice to prevent this thing happening ahead of time. You know, what are the policy solutions, what are the market controls, market behaviors, solutions, if any, that are available here? Because as you and I spoke you know, previously to the to start of recording, it's not like the monetary policy and typical central bank tools have the ability to really work on commodities like they do on debt markets, et cetera. Right. And, and so, uh, you know, there are a couple aspects to that. So, uh, you know, speaking broadly, you know, central banks do have uh, policy tools uh, at their disposal and ones that they've deployed in the past. So really what it comes down to is that these kinds of scenarios that we talked about are really sort of liquidity crises. And that was what central banks were originally set up to address, it would be the lender of last resort to respond to liquidity shocks and provide liquidity to a system that experienced a big increase in demand for it. Again, I harken back to the March 2020, I have an article about this in the Journal of Applied Corporate Finance. Uh, you know, essentially, the Fed uh, supplied additional liquidity to the market when the clearing system came under stress uh, due to the COVID shock. And noted earlier uh, what Alan Greenspan did during the crash of 87. But as you note, uh, that was essentially focused on the channels where the central banks are already connected. So yeah, they, yeah, they're basically interfacing with the banking system. And in the event of a commodity shock that has an impact on the commodity firms, they would not have sort of a direct pipe to provide liquidity to those entities. And so there would have to be something that would be indirect. So what I would uh, envision uh, or what I would suggest is, and I hope it's going on, is that there is some planning going on at the ECB, Federal Reserve, Bank of Japan, you know, major central banks to essentially create mechanisms that permit the supply of liquidity to the commodity sector in the event of, uh, of, of this breaking out again. So the system is not configured to do that directly. It has to be done indirectly. But that's, uh, you know, hopefully there are contingency plans in place uh, in order to do that. Uh, and again, I, I would note that you know, that essentially was what uh, Greenspan mm. did was that who was in trouble in October of 87 were futures commission merchants, and you know, the, they did not have a direct relationship with the Fed. So what bank, basically Greenspan did is he leaned on the banks and told the banks, hey, supply liquidity to these FCMs so they don't fold. You know, that was done you know, literally you know, off the cuff, probably four o'clock in the morning on October 20th. Uh, hopefully that you know, sort of contingency plans are in place to avoid having to do that extemporaneously uh, in the future. Staying on this in particular, if major central banks are currently contingency planning for a rehash of the events that have happened over the last six months, does that mean, and that presumably does mean, that they are therefore going to start thinking about regulation going forwards? And if so, what type of regulation do you expect to see come down the pike? Yeah, that's interesting. And I, I just read an article on the FT this morning about the secure SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States, wanting to register anybody who does a sufficient amount of volume uh, in the Treasury, United States Treasury markets as dealers. 
And so, you know, hedge funds, uh, high frequency traders that are currently not regulated as dealers, uh, the SEC wants to bring them under that umbrella. And so one could imagine, you know, sort of similar sorts of, of registration uh, requirements or, you know, some other sorts of requirements that would bring these firms under more direct government regulation. So now, you know, so a, a commodity trading firm that has a futures trading affiliate our subsidiary, yeah, that affiliate is registered and regulated. But to the extent that there's sort of a provision of some implicit or explicit backstop to the commodity firms more generally, I think it would be inevitable that some sort of registration plus additional regulation would follow. No free lunches. No, no. Can you be? I get, what would that, you know? Can you just be a bit more specific about what you think it would entail? Would it, you know, in line with other sort of regulation around swap dealers and so forth? Is this capital requirements? Um, you know, reserves. Yeah. So that, that was one thing that came up in uh, 2014, 2015. Uh, the European Commission was talking about uh, implementing a capital requirements uh, regime for commodity trading firms. That faded away. So that would be one approach. Another could be, for example, trying to expand position limits uh, outside of just uh, derivatives, but you know, essentially try to uh, constrain the sizes of other positions uh, that these firms can hold, maybe even in physical commodities. I, I had a, a discussion with some economists, the European Commission the other day, and that's one of the, the things that they brought up, hey, well, what about position limits, imposing and position limits on on these kind of companies? Now, it was, they were talking, I think, hypothetically, but that sort of gives you an indication of where the first idea that comes to mind to people that are thinking about these issues and have a, a regulatory responsibility. Yeah. Um, I can, I can, feel listeners' blood starting to boil in some cases. Yes. Um, and we we do have the CFTC coming on later in the in the in the summer. So we'll get some views from that as from them as well. Okay, so we'll leave that there because I don't want to catch any blame for giving anyone any ideas on regulation. Right. <laughs> um, so that is but again, this these are things I know at the leadership level across the commodity trading world, you know, are having to be discussed, accounted for planned for and thought about are in some cases relatively new things. Um, so it's it's going to be more disruptive, more uncertain future on, on how we, we navigate this. The second bit is, okay, how a big thing ultimately, it seems like one of the sort of the real catastrophic element here is, you know, okay, fine, if you lose one of the big, as dire as it would be for the people who work for that organization, and it would have cascading losses across the sector, a company is very different to losing an exchange. You know, one of the big exchanges failing would be catastrophic. What, if anything, do the exchanges need to be doing in light of what happened to the LME and so forth to to better protect themselves from that event? Yeah, they perform essentially a shock absorbing function as well. So the potentially greater capitalization by exchanges and by uh, you know, clearing houses and clearing members. So, you know, you know, there's something called the default waterfall and sort of the, it's supposed to be a loser pay system where the market participants post enough collateral to be able to cover their, their losses. Uh, in the event that that is not sufficient, then the next step in the, uh, in the default waterfall is the, the clearing members of exchanges and the clearing houses themselves. And this is something that the LME did in the aftermath of the uh, of, of the nickel episode, is that they dramatically increased the contribution that clearing members uh, had to make to the default fund. So that that would be the sort of the first line of defense at the exchange clearing clearing member level. I note that this is a uh, has been a matter of ongoing controversy. A lot of the clearing members, who are, as I noted before now, are primarily the big banks. They believe that clearing houses should put more skin in the game, that they should commit more of their equity to uh, backing up the clearing houses. So that's likely, that debate is likely to heat up as exchanges, clearing houses demand uh, that their members, their clearing members, uh, put up uh, more capital to uh, back up the clearing house that the clearing members are going to push back and say, hey, you know, you guys got to stump up 
some more too. Is there, you know, and, and being slightly sort of philosophical here, are, are we much better off saying any regulation introduces moral hazard into the system, you're favoring one group over another, and these markets operate best when they are just, they're free and open and it's caveat emptor and, you know, those organizations that aren't best prepared for the risks involved will go down. Um, compared to regulating to avoid one of these events. In other words, another way of saying it is, are these markets now essentially too big to fail? And you will just see governments have to intervene. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, so the clearing mechanism is too big to fail. Yes, yeah, so in the aftermath of the financial crisis, immediately the response by regulators and politicians around the world was, oh, we need to make everything more futures industry-like and expand clearing uh, more broadly. And one of the downsides of that was that it increased even more the significant systemic importance of these institutions and raised the uh, you know, potential for moral hazard. Uh, because again, I mean, you just... You, you, you just go through the game tree, it's hard to imagine that there would not be an implicit or explicit bailout you know, in the event of the, the potential failure of, of major parts of the clearing system. So yeah, moral hazard in that respect is sort of unavoidable. I wish I had the solution to this dilemma, but I don't. It's, it's just mm -hmm. one that's sort of inherent in the system. And it's one of the reasons why I cautioned about supersizing the clearing system, which is essentially what happened in the aftermath of the financial crisis. Clearing Cassandra, yeah. And I wonder how uh, if the public found it quite difficult to swallow um, investment banker bonuses yes. in the wake of the global financial crisis. Yes. I wonder how they feel about swallowing some uh, commodity trader bonuses, yes. which uh, can often be substantially larger, especially in volatile periods. Yes. But, well, Craig, it's always, I think listeners can tell how much I've enjoyed the discussion by how long we've run on for. Okay. Um, but it's always fascinating to have you on. And, you know, hopefully we can have you back in, in the near future and uh, or next year. And, and hopefully all of this will remain academic. Yes, I, I was going to say, well, thank you very much for having me on. And I hope that, that it's not a, a, a crisis that is what precipitates our, our next session. Yeah, excellent. So people can fi you know, find you at the University of Houston. You've also got your Streetwise Professor blog. Um, and, you know, you're, you're active on social media as well if they want to reach out. Absolutely. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and HC Group, a search and advisory firm dedicated to the commodity markets, visit our website at www.hcgroup.global. There you can find out more about our services and our offices around the world. There you can also find more content from interviews to insight pieces to more podcasts focused on the commodity value chains. Thanks again for listening.